Good morning and welcome to church today. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So it's, it's good to be together this morning. Let's pray this morning. Father, it's good to be in your house and it's good to be in your presence this morning. We would say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come and have your way in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we can come and offer our praise and our worship and that you can speak to us through your word today. We just want to say that we love you, Jesus, and we give our, our thanks and our praise to you for what, what, what you're going to do in us today in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. son. What's a widow? Anybody know what a widow is? That's, that's a woman whose husband has died, which is a bit sad. One day, that's what happened to her. One day when Jesus and his disciples were entering a town, they arrived in time to see a funeral procession coming through the city gates. The dead man was the only son of a widow. She was heartbroken. What does heartbroken mean? Very, very happy? No? Very 
sad because her husband had died and now her son had died. When Jesus saw her, his heart was filled with pity. He walked up to her and said gently, don't cry. Then he moved over and touched the stretcher and the man, the men carrying it stopped. Jesus said, young man, get up. At his words, to the astonishment and awe of the mourners, the dead man sat up and began to talk. Jesus led him to his mother, who was filled with thankfulness and joy. So this woman, her husband had already died, and she only had one son, and then he died. So she was very sad. And what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? He told, he told, he spoke to the dead boy or dead man and said, get up. And he got up. He was alive again. So do you think the mum was happy? She was just excited. And what about the, all the people who were watching? They were happy too. They were excited. Do you think they told anyone else about it? Yeah, I think they told everybody. Guess what happened today? You'll never guess what happened, what we saw today. This man was dead and, the, and Jesus came and told him to get up and he was alive again. So the news about Jesus just spread like everywhere. What do you do when you have good news about something? Mum's made my favourite kind of cookies. Do you keep that? You might keep that a secret, mightn't you? Don't tell anybody about that. What say something really good happens at your at your house? What would you do? Would you keep it a secret? Do you tell your friends? Yeah. Usually, when something good happens, it's a bit hard to keep that a secret, isn't it? Anybody had had a secret that was really really exciting? That's the hardest kind of secret to tell, isn't it? To keep, isn't it? Something bad happens. It's easy to talk about that. But if it's a happy secret, it's so hard to keep it quiet. Now, this woman had something very, very special and happy happen for her. Today we've got communion. Is that a happy time or a sad time? A happy time. A happy time. And why is it happy? Do you know? Why is communion a happy time? Because what, what did God do? Say again. Big voice. Why is communion a happy time? Because it reminds us that God loves us why is it that so many people come to communion and they think it's a sad time no one's answering when we come today it's a happy time yes sometimes we're reminded about the things that we do wrong but it's a happy time because it reminds us God loves us. He loves us so much. And we wouldn't want to keep that a secret, would we? Mm. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the story of the, the man that was dead but came alive. Thank you for the, the way the mother went from so sad and heartbroken to so happy and thank you for the story of communion that we can share in it today not because we're bad but because you're so good because you love us beyond anything we could measure so help us lord to love you back help us lord to share the happy news help us to be happy about it bless these little ones lord Help them grow to know you and love you. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Very good. Okay. We'll have communion soon and then there'll be kids' church. We're, <coughs> we're coming to our, our worship time. And, and just before we do, the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, there's a, a, verse, a verse of scripture that says, um, Times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And, and you know, y- y- you might have, might have had a, 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 um, a hard week and um, things have up- upset you and stressed you. And, um, but this morning I just want to invite you to, um, as we worship, just to let the Lord refresh you. Let the presence of the Lord come and, and refresh you because um, refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. So let's let's stand and worship the Lord together. Amen. Father, I thank you for all you have done. You have gave your son freely for me. And I praise you for calling me, drawing me near. Out of blindness, you caused me to see. Spirit of life, you are God's holy fire. You have kindled my heart with your praise. And I know. Oh, Lord, above all. 
exalt you Lord we worship you Jesus we praise you Lord Amen and Amen thank you Jesus Amen Amen thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Praise you, Jesus. Mighty God. Mighty God. Praise you, Jesus. I just get um, this <clears throat> Psalm from Psalm 104, verse 15. Um, just thinking about communion. Wine that gladdens the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread that sustains his heart. And I feel like sometimes, for me anyway, just feel kind of weak, and it's like we come and we just need to receive. It's not about what we can give to him necessarily, but he wants to strengthen our hearts anoint us afresh with oil. Um, the Bible talks about the oil of joy and wine to make uh, oil to make our face shine and wine that gladdens our hearts. So I just feel like, you know, if we can just, I don't know if it's just for me or for all of us, but just to receive, just to take time to believe that and just to receive from him especially as we come to communion.
Another word of encouragement? Let's just be a little bit greedy, shall we? There's a fresh thought. Christians, let's be a little bit greedy. God might have more he wants to say. Okay. The elders serving, come, please. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, broke it. This is my body broken for you. And after supper, he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in memory of me. Let's pray. Father, the story reminds us of two things reminds us of the great price paid for our salvation. The pain that Jesus endured, the mocking, the beating, the shame of it all. But we know over and above this is the great love that redeems us and through the death of Jesus we have life. Thank you, Father, for all the ways you remind us of this. You confirm the covenant in our lives. You work in us, even though sometimes we are so weak. We pray that as we share today, let the life of Christ flow through us. Each one, Lord, today, strengthen, bring wholeness, bring healing, bring faith Bring peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Would the families come forward first and then others follow? Thank you.
God answered a prayer, showed you something special. Well, Lord, we need to know your touch in our lives every day. Pray, Holy Spirit, I, I give you permission to touch our lives. We, encourage, we ask you, Lord, to move among us, to inspire, to embolden, help us with our speaking, our witness, our receiving, in Jesus' name. Amen. Leslie's bringing our scripture reading today. Chapter 9, verses 1 to 9, and it's on page 1004 in your pew Bible. Jesus sends out the twelve. When Jesus had called the twelve together... He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, Leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared and others, still others, that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. Amen. Thank you, Father, again for your word. Please guide my speaking, guide our hearing. In Jesus' name. It is so important that we are crystal clear about what we are and who we are as church. So important. We looked last week at the first of five key purposes revealed in the New Testament. Anybody off the top of the head, tell me five. See, this is, go Louise. You're allowed to. Fellowship, evangelism, adoration, service, teaching. No, you didn't say, you should have said Who wants to try now? No? Like I said, it's really important. Who wants to be part of church or any organization? You don't know what you're there for. 
What say you remember the fire brigade? Oh, what do we do now, Dad? <laughs> Goodness me. You ha- we have to know what we're here for. And we should be able to push the button on each of us, bang, we've got it. We know what we're there for. And there might be something that you uh, shine in particularly, but we need to know the breadth of the purpose God has called his church to. What typically happens uh, today still, but through history, when a new denomination is formed, invariably it's because someone's got a vision about some aspect of the church's purpose. Way back, the Catholic Church were kind of the hub of things. There was the Reformation. There were things like, well, let's get back to Scripture. Other churches at other times, let's get back to serving people who are needy. Other, someone else come along and say, well, let's start loving people like we're supposed to. What's so important for church today is understand the breadth of this. Let's not just be one horse races. Let's not just be experts in one aspect of what God has called us to. Let's have a really strong grip of this. Because in being strong in all makes the church, its mission, strong. Yep. Otherwise, we're dull and uninteresting and ineffective. Well, let's get some good news going. We looked last week at the whole purpose of expressing the love of God. Jesus said things like this to his disciples. Love one another as I have loved you. By this all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love is crucial. So we, we kind of express that in things like, well, we use the word fellowship. You get to the end of the series, you'll remember why. We want to... We want for those who are part of St. Andrews, and I'm not saying we're perfect, but this is, a, this is what we aim for, that everybody in St. Andrews and those even on the fringe, those who might come to us for something like a funeral service, they get to feel the welcome of God. Not just hear about it, but we need for them to feel this welcome, this love. Now, love is important, but it's not the only purpose. Another way to get insights into the purpose we're called to is to ask, well, what did Jesus actually tell his disciples to do? That would make sense, wouldn't it? What did he ask them to do? So some of you, I know, began a list of scriptures those, the ones we just touched on last week were about love. So today's passage is going to answer a different question. So what did Jesus ask his disciples to do? We're best to approach this in a simple, plain kind of way. We don't need to get all complicated with multiple levels of interpretation and all the rest of it. What did he ask the disciples to do? Chances are, if he's asked the disciples to do that, that's a good clue for us, isn't it? Maybe we should be doing the same. Is that a fair assumption? I I see some nods and I hear some mumbles. Is that fair for us to assume? Yes? Good. Especially, you know, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said, teach others what I commanded you. That means what he said for them to do, we should take as instruction for us. Our passage today is one of those kinds of scriptures. So we're just dipping into it today, um, but what what are we noticing? I'll read read just a part of uh, the passage. Jesus came... Jesus gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. 
Now, for me, this passages like this are in some ways disturbing and exciting. Disturbing because it's reminding me this is what we're not doing. And I feel a little bit convicted about it. We, we, we're not doing what he told them to do. But it's exciting also because if we could grasp a hold of this, it would revolutionize our faith. Let's discuss a little bit what's the background or the setting of this passage. What's going on when Jesus sends out the 12? Is it near the beginning, the middle, or the end of Jesus' ministry? Beginning. Many people had not yet heard of Jesus, right? So he, he sends them out. Had they been to Bible college? Did, would you rate them as uh, novices, intermediates, or experts? Novices. They had hardly started. Jesus says, out you go, tell some stories like I've told you, preach the... No. No. Somebody said it. What did he tell them to preach? See, this is one of our problems. We've heard these things so often, it short circuits from what's on the page to what comes out our mouth. What Look it up. What did he say for them to preach? What did he tell them to do? I'm going to open my Bible. The Bible's gone. You've got a little bit longer. What did he tell them to do? Who said that? That's all right. I told you to read it. Obedient people get rewarded. <laughs> See, this is, why, this is why we have sermons in church so we, we know we know the Word. And that's why you go home, instead of watching sport or something else on TV, you think about what the preacher said on Sunday morning. Yes? Is this what the Bible says? And then after you a practice at that, is this consistent with the breadth of Scripture? Or did he just pick his hobby horse? Jesus told those disciples to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Are we in agreement? Yes? All right. What's kingdom? I know you, many of you know this. Let's just reinforce. What's kingdom? Short circuit. Excellent. I don't mind if we run out of chocolate, so I'll have to be in good with the angel. That Okay. Reign of God. The way I remember it, kingdom is short for king's domain. Where the king's ruling, that's the kingdom. It's not just in heaven one day when we get there. It's whenever, wherever, the king is reigning. The king's domain. Now, imagine for a minute, what would life be like? What would the world be like if people let God truly rule? That would be excellent. That would be like heaven on earth. So we don't need to wait. One day we will go and be with him. But God's purpose is that his reign, his influence, his dominion would be in our lives and in our communities and across the world sooner rather than later. Over the years, preachers 
have tended to major on the news that Jesus died for our sin and rose again. Now, what do you think? What proportion, of all the things those disciples preached, how much of it was about Jesus' death and resurrection? <laughs> Did you, I'll ask the, it was such a good answer, I'll ask the question again. <laughs> when, when the di- disciples went out and they preached the kingdom of God, how much of their preaching was to do with the death and resurrection of Jesus? None. Now, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? When, you, when people say, preach the gospel, what part of the gospel are you talking about? See, when, when Jesus died and rose, God made, it gave us access to the kingdom. So, the good news about his death and resurrection, our sins forgiven, we celebrate that again this morning. That's God's invitation. Come into my reign, my rule, my authority. The gospel of salvation is our entry point. So God wants us to come in and to be Uh, to enjoy life with him in his kingdom. Much of what is talked about in churches today, you know, the invisible screen, much of what is talked about in churches today barely would have got a mention when the disciples were sent out. That tells me it's time we got really serious as Christian believers to evaluating the message we preach. What do we show and tell in Jesus' name? Is it consistent with what he told his disciples to do? What's the good news we're sharing? The message about Jesus and dying and rising, not taking anything away from that, but if that's the beginning and the end of our preaching or what we call the gospel, I think we're selling people short. Let's talk about the kingdom. Let's talk about what it means when God's in charge of our lives, when his power and authority flows through us. So here at St. Andrews, we are determined to tell the story of the gospel of the kingdom. How we come into it, how we live our lives in relationship with them. This is the good news. This is what we call evangelism. No disrespect from men of God like um, Billy Graham, who was famous for preaching the message about Jesus' death and resurrection and our salvation, right? That was absolutely needed because the church in many ways had, had wandered far from that. But we need for people to get a grasp of What does it mean when we say, Jesus is not just my Savior, he's my Lord. He's in charge of my life. When he says, do this, I say, yes, Lord. When he says, speak to this one, heal that one, visit that one, yes, Lord, we'll do what you say. There are different ways to show and tell the good news. One of the easiest is by offering alpha courses. We do this in different formats, and this term we're trialing uh, the the youth alpha course with our kids club. Over the years, 
um, proclaiming the good news has been a weak point in the ministry of St. Andrews. We're, we're better as a church, or historically, at different aspects. Sharing this good news, helping people find faith and saying, yes, Lord, we're not so good at that. But I've been so encouraged at the fruit that's come in people's lives when they've shared in a course, they've been in dialogue with others, they've along the way discovered faith for themselves in a new way. Not many churches do that. We've only had time to dip today, so I do want to come back to this next week. Hopefully you're interested in that. But um, being clear about what we're called to is so important. And when we start moving with him and taking our lead from the New Testament, we become way more effective. Yeah? Amen. We're going to stand and sing our final hymn, I Will Sing the Wonder Story. And in singing the wonder story, we're actually telling it as well. Amen? Amen.
Amen. What a, what a great hymn that is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can bring our tithes and our offerings to you this morning. We pray your blessing upon them and the blessing the, um, on those who have given. We thank you for that promise. And Father, we just pray that you'll go with us as we go out into the world this week. And Father, give us opportunities to tell people about um, what you've done and to, to show them what, what the, um, the gospel and, and your love is all about. So we thank you, God, for opportunities to do that. So we just pray your blessing will go with us in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. We're going to turn, turn, turn to one another and we're, let's, let's um, say the grace. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the